What's up guys, it's Chili. Microsoft just posted their new preview for the Byzantines and I am so excited to talk about this with you guys. There's a lot going on here so let's get right on into it. Alright, so first let's talk about the cover art. Another gorgeous piece by Craig Mullins, one of the best artists in the business. Front and center we got these wide boys over here. In the middle we have what looks to be a Byzantine leader. He's got the purple cape, the purple dress. Historically, I'm not sure if Byzantines wore purple for their military uniforms, but it's kind of an iconic color for the Byzantines, so it kind of makes sense to represent the Byzantine man with the purple outfit. Flanked to his sides are two what looks to be Varangian guards. You can see them carrying these axes. Of course, the Varangian guards were the bodyguards of the emperor, so it makes sense for them to be guarding this important Byzantine leader right here. You can see that the standing on the ramparts clearly defending a wall it looks like the city around them is on fire and i love 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 that craig mullins took the gold threads motif that's common throughout all the age of empires 4 art pieces but in this piece the golden threads are actually the arcs of a flamethrower that the jets shooting out of a flamethrower you can see them kind of spewing out onto the battlements here it looks like this over on the left is either um a makeshift tower or maybe even a siege tower it looks like there's some folks trying to get onto this bridge here this some fighting and in the background we can see what looks to be like a byzantine church or cathedral it looks very similar to the abbey of trinity that the rus have in the game this kind of tower with tall windows is just a very common motif in eastern european uh, orthodox church design there's many different kinds of examples of byzantine architecture that use it i don't know if it's referencing a, a specific one a really really awesome piece here clearly depicting the byzantines defending against the siege the byzantines throughout the middle ages were basically famous for slow slowly crumbling, trying to defend their empire while they're beset by enemies on all fronts. Uh, in particular, the use of flamethrowers was most prominent during the Arab invasions in 672, sorry, 674 and 717. These were two massive Arab invasions uh, led by the Umayyad Caliphate, trying to take over Constantinople, but they were propelled by the use of Greek flamethrowers. And that was the date that I started my Byzantine concept in. Uh, around that time period to try to capture the use of the flamethrowers against the Arab invasions. But interestingly, the official Byzantine uh, faction will not start until the early 9th century. Now, the early 9th century is more of a low point in Byzantine history. That's around the time of the iconoclasms, where there's a lot of conflict around whether or not holy figures can be depicted in their co in Byzantine coinage and Byzantine art. And there's a lot of chaos during that time period. So I guess it kind of makes sense to depict the Dark Ages. Uh, after all, the first Asian Age of Empires IV is the, it's called the Dark Age. So it's kind of a low point in Byzantine history and then they can kind of build up from there so that makes a ton of sense and also ending in the mid 15th century also makes a lot of sense uh, Constantinople was famously taken over by Mehmed II in 1453 when the Ottomans used their great bombards and sieged down the walls of Constantinople so it's a very reasonable end date let's move on to the structures so the core mechanic for the Byzantines is gonna be their cisterns with these aqueducts I've gushed about this before but I'll gush about it again I, I love the idea of using aqueducts I also really like what they did with the cisterns the cisterns seem to have a aura that boosts the gathering rate of units around them and in particular the cisterns look like they'll have a similar radius mechanic as the Rus hunting cabins where you have to build the cisterns uh, far away from each other so that they don't overlap and this is what kind of compels players to connect them with the aqueducts I love that it makes a ton of sense this is something I predicted in my previous Byzantine preview I'm really looking forward to how Byzantine players are going to be laying out their bases I feel like this creates a ton of opportunity for unique basically puzzle building mechanics for laying out your city Looking into the landmarks here, the first landmark that they have here is the, called the Grand Winery. It's a little bit interesting that the Byzantines will have this olive oil farm that kind of replaces their traditional farm, but then the, the building that kind of boosts the olive oil farms is called a winery, which is a totally separate kind of crop, but I mean, sure, I get it. I, I, I can see why they went for something like this. The architecture here is very representative of, again, Byzantine monastery design. I think this one is a bit generic. The closest example of a monastery that I could find to this specific kind of design is the Krakanika Monastery in Serbia. You can very clearly see a very similar tower with these windows as well as these arches around all four corners. This is just a very common trope in Orthodox design. I'm not sure if they actually base it off of the Serbian monastery or not, but I still love the way it looks. And sure, I can believe that, you know, it gets incorporated into some kind of winery type of structure. It's a bit of fantasy, but I, I still love it. The Imperial Hippodrome, we've already seen what that looks like in another picture that was released prior. The Hippodrome is something that was built back during the Roman time. It was a very central and important structure 
within Byzantine society. Pretty much every citizen in Constantinople was obsessed with watching these Hippodrome races. It sounds like the Hippodrome is going to work something similar to the School of Cavalry, where it's going to help boost your cavalry training times in some way. That was actually part of my original thinking of what the Hippodrome should do, but I'm a little bit disappointed with it. I feel like that you could get a little bit more inspired with the design here. For my updated version of the concept, the Hippodrome was a way to uh, garrison villagers and generate some kind of unique bonuses, uh, which I think is a little bit more interesting than just having it be kind of a generic cavalry landmark. Moving on to age three, we have the Golden Horn Tower, uh, which is very clearly inspired by the Galata Tower, uh, which is in the Galata district, just north of the main Byzantine city. Not only is this a very outstanding and popular tourist destination, even in today's Istanbul, it was also one of the most prominent structures historically as well. And it was also not a Byzantine structure. Historically, this was actually built by the Genoese who established a merchant colony uh, in the Galata district. And in order to protect their holdings there, they built the original Galata Tower. It all rests right on the Golden Horn, which is probably why this is called the Golden Horn Tower. So the name is a little bit made up, but it's very clearly based on uh, this historic landmark. We actually saw an example of this tower back in a previous picture that was already released. Originally, I had thought that this was actually part of the wall. So it was going to be a part of the, the Theodosian walls, maybe a, a landmark that ties into the wall. But evidently, it was just actually <laughs> sitting just in front of the wall. And I just kind of misread it when I was looking at the image. In any case, I love the reference here. The fact that it can recruit mercenaries at no cost makes a lot of sense. The Genoese were often employed as mercenaries by the Byzantines. And the fact that this is originally a Genoese structure, it makes a lot of sense to tie that mechanic into this. The second landmark is the Cistern of the First Hill. We actually also saw a example of this cistern in a previous image as well. I pointed out that the cistern in this image looked kind of bigger, uh, almost landmark size compared to the other cisterns. Uh, I originally thought that they were going to be depicting the cistern of Aetius, which is the largest cistern in Constantinople. But that cistern is actually on the outskirts uh, of Constantinople, closer to the wall on the on the western edge. Constantinople uh, is divided into different sections, uh, all based on these hills, kind of like how Rome was founded on the Palatine Hills. The first hills were the kind of imperial quarters. This is where all the important landmarks, where the palace was, where the Hagia Sophia was. There is a very famous cistern here as well it's known today as the Basilica Cistern. It's a very famous tourist destination in Istanbul. It's right next to all the other famous tourist destinations. You can go inside and you can see these awesome vaulted arches. Uh, they emptied out the cistern so you can kind of walk through it and it just looks amazing. So still a really great choice of cistern. I'm really glad that they have it represented in the game. The fact that it provides a powerful healing effect called the Pilgrim Flask is really cool because it allows you to heal even at a distance. In my original concept for the Byzantines, I also had a landmark that allowed you to heal at a distance as the Byzantines were one of the first pioneers for hospitals uh, in the medieval world, so it makes a lot of sense that they would have some kind of healing related technology. The pilgrim flask itself is a reference to water flasks that pilgrims would carry with them as they were perhaps going towards the crusades or something like that. Uh, a lot of crusaders passed through the Byzantine Empire on their way to the Holy Land, so it kind of makes sense to give them this kind of uh, technology. And lastly, in age four, we have the foreign engineering company, which is probably what's represented here. That's why we see the nest of bees next to it. It can train siege engines from other civilizations. The structure here, I'm guessing is based on the Bacolian Palace. It was one of the famous palaces for later Byzantine emperors, especially after the main Constantinople palace was destroyed in the various attacks. You can see in other artists' representations of the Bokolian palace, we have these arches, we have this uh, lighthouse looking fixture, which you can clearly see in this structure as well. I'm not the biggest fan, however, of giving the Byzantines the ability to produce siege engines from other civilizations, especially the nest of bees. It just nests of bees are such an iconic, like play style defining unit for the Chinese. Giving it to the Byzantines just seems like it kind of it lessens the uniqueness of the Chinese nest of bees. It also doesn't really make sense because the Byzantines didn't really have that much contact with China. They certainly didn't have access to gunpowder technology from China. So I think this is a little bit of a miss. As this game evolves and more and more factions and more and more units get added, there's a real risk on the design side of blending things too much. If too many civilizations have access to the same things, if there's too many units that essentially do the same things, it makes each civ less and less distinct, which is one of the best things about Age of Empires 4 right now is that every civilization plays in its own completely unique way. And when there are unique units, they're very unique compared to other civilizations. The only example in game so far of something like this is the Cognate Palace for the Mongols, which trains random units from other civilizations, but at least in that case, it was civilizations that were within the domain of the Mongols. So the Chinese were taken over by the Mongols, the Rus were taken over by the Mongols. So it kind of makes a little bit of historical sense, at least thematically, that they would have access to units from those areas. And also because the units spawn randomly, nobody ever builds that landmark.
landmarks, so we don't really see the Mongols using nest of bees too much. But I still want to avoid the situation because when you see a nest of bees, you should be thinking, oh, I, there's a Chinese player in the game. You shouldn't be thinking, oh, there might be a Byzantine player, there might be a Mongol player. Like, I don't know what to expect. When I see nest of bees, am I going to see palace guards with it or am I going to see cataphracts with it? I don't even know. It just makes the game more and more complicated for new players to get a grasp of. Another thing I want to point out here, I just noticed this, is that the, uh, the rooftop of this structure has these kind of Asiatic looking pointed uh, curves on the t on the top of the tiling. I've never seen this in any example of Byzantine architecture. So this could be a reference to like, I don't know, maybe like there's a Chinese quarter within this structure, within this empire or something like that. And that's why they can justify getting the nest of bees here. Again, a little bit of fantasy. I don't think the Chinese ever made it to the Byzantine empire, at least not in any significant capacity. So a little bit of a strange uh, structure here. The other H4 landmark that we don't get a look at is the Palatine School. This is a great reference to the Scholae Palatinae, which were the basically the elite military wing of the Byzantines. These were the palace guards, the strongest and best equipped warriors within the entire empire. The Palatine Schools were more of an early Byzantine thing though, as by the time of the Tagmata system, they would get subsumed into that system instead. Uh, so it's a little bit weird that it's an H4 landmark, but not a big deal. Uh, I think it's a great reference and uh, really cool that we get to see something like this. All right, now let's talk about the units. Of course, everyone's been waiting for the iconic cataphracts to show up. Uh, I absolutely love the way that they look. A lot of heavy armor, big teardrop shields. The face masks are a very interesting direction to go in. I wasn't expecting the face masks. Uh, a lot of times you'll see a uh, chainmail face masks instead of this kind of like a uh, Roman style face mask. But you know, I guess they're the Romans in the game. So it, it makes sense to uh, include that in this design. It looks like they're going to cost more than the knight that they replace and they can trample uh, across units that they're uh, fighting. So I'm really curious to see uh, what that will look like. I don't know uh, what exactly it means, but I mean, there's the super heavy cavalry that we've always expected, uh, even back since Age of Empires 2. They were trampling across all of the enemy units, uh, defeating their main counters, even uh, spearmen. So I'm excited to see uh, what these guys are going to bring in this game. Up next is the Varangian Guard. I took a look at these units previously, and I thought these were just the men at arms for the Byzantines. Pleasant surprise that they're actually the Varangian Guard. I thought that they weren't the Varangian Guard because they weren't using the iconic bearded axe that the Varangians are known for, instead using these sword and shield combo. The Looks like the Varangian Guard will have access to a unique ability that allows them to switch into a two-handed bearded axe stance. So that's a really cool mechanic. I'm really curious about how that would work. It looks like when they were trying to make this unit unique, they're also playing around with a few different mechanics here. In my latest version of the Varangian Guard concept, I made them medium infantry that had a slow attack but would deal a lot of damage with each hit. And then the more they attack with their bearded axes, the faster they would hit. And the fact that they were medium infantry meant that they occupied a very unique role within the army. It looks like they were going for a very different direction. These guys the fact that they can switch between axes and sword and shield means that they can probably switch between a more heavily armored stance where they are resistant to range fire versus a more highly damaging stance where they are maybe weaker to archers but stronger against melee units. So I like that mechanic. That's really cool. Uh, I'm excited to see how these guys play in game. They look awesome. They very clearly have these Viking inspired face masks and then the fur capes also kind of references their northern roots. Uh, really cool design here. Uh, we also, as a, as a slight bonus, is a little bit of a, uh, we get a higher resolution image of the crosswoman over here. Very interesting design here. A really cool looking helmet. I'm personally not familiar with this kind of helmet, so uh, this is pretty exciting. If you guys know more about it, let me know. But I, I like the way they look. They look really awesome. Next up is, of course, the Cairo Siphon, the famous flamethrower that the Byzantines employed. Uh, it looks like it will be replacing the ram. So instead of a regular ram, the Byzantines will be building these guys. Uh, it obviously looks like a ram. And we already saw these guys in action in a previous trailer. One thing that's interesting that we didn't know about was the fact that the flames that they would emit would actually stick to the ground and and any units that walk over that ground now suffer potential damage. So that means that this is a ram that has real applications in combat as well when they're fighting just against units. Uh, that's really exciting. That's not something that I included in my original concept. In my original concept for the Cairo Siphon, I imagined them being the hand cannon replacement, so they would actually be handheld. The preview here actually references handheld flamethrowers, so I'm a little bit surprised that they would reference it and then make a ram that shoots the uh, flamethrower. I imagined them as the replacement for the hand cannon for the Byzantines, as the Byzantines were basically done by the time uh, hand cannons really became prominent throughout the Middle Ages. So it's interesting that they're going in this direction. I love that the ground is going to be on fire. That's not something that I included in my design because I just didn't think that the devs would be able to implement something like that, but it's an awesome mechanic. And it means that the Byzantines are going to be fighting like none other. They can kind of deny certain pieces of land and force uh, enemy players to fight in a perhaps disadvantaged engagement. Uh, another thing that's really cool is that 
it looks like Greek fire will also be able to be spread by trebuchets and dromons. Dromons were the famous dragon ships of the Byzantine navy, so I imagine it'll work very similar to the Cairo siphon. The fact that trebuchets can also shoot Greek fire means that you can lay out a lot of fire on the battlefield before anyone even arrives there. So really cool mechanic here. I, I'm a big fan of this. The last thing you need to take a look at here is the limitane. These are the replacement for the spears for the Byzantines. It looks like they're going to be more armored. They're going to have a little bit less attack, a little bit less movement speed, but they have shields, which makes them more resistant to range fire. That's really interesting, and I'm, I'm a bit curious why the why the devs went with this design. Obviously, the fact that the spears are slower moving and more guarded means that it kind of defines the Byzantines as a little bit more of a shielded, well-armored empire. I like that. But the fact that they have a shield wall mechanic is something I'm not the biggest fan of, as the Byzantines already seem to have a lot going for them. Shield walls would have been much better for the Danish, perhaps, or some kind of Viking civ. I recently posted my Dane civilization concept, and shield walls were just such a prominent feature in Viking warfare. And comparatively, there's much fewer mechanics that you could add to the Vikings, so it makes more sense for that faction to have it. It's a little bit disappointing that they gave it to the Byzantines instead, uh, but ultimately it's not that big of a deal. Obviously, a lot of different empires around the Middle Ages use shield walls, so it makes sense that the Byzantines would have it. And clearly, it will help define their kind of maybe slow-moving but well-armored uh, uh, identity. The other thing I have a slight issue with here is calling them Limitane. Historically, Limitane were more of a early Byzantine uh, type of unit from more of a remnant from the Roman era. Limitane were essentially the border guards uh, for the Roman Empire. I would have preferred that either these guys be called the Minolians, where they were Byzantine pikemen, or maybe the Scutatoi, uh, which were the Byzantine shield bearers. Um, those seem like more relevant names than the Limitane, so I'm a little bit surprised by that. Uh, generally speaking, Age of Empires 4 has not used more complex native sounding words unless the unit is particularly uh, famous and well known. Uh, so for instance, Sapahi is used uh, because it's a very famous and well-known unit within Age of Empires, but the Chinese palace guards are just called palace guards, a very generic English uh, sounding name. So it's weird that they would call them Limitane in this case. All right, that's pretty much all I have to say about the Byzantine preview here. I am incredibly hyped. I can't be more excited. There's so many things I'm super excited about. They got a lot of these units so right. A lot of these structures and the mechanics are just almost exactly what I was looking for. A few things here and there are a little bit weird. I, I'm not the biggest fan of the mercenary mechanic that they're going for, especially building siege units from other civilizations. And then some of the names are a little bit iffy, but uh, overall, just I'm a big, big fan of what, what I'm seeing here. And I can't wait to play this faction and get into it with you guys. All right, that's it for me. If you found this interesting at all, uh, please leave a like uh, and please hit me with a subscribe. I have so many more things planned in the future for you guys. So thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Stay frosty and stay chilly.